Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us and welcome to yet another uh, Eurocontrol Hard Talk Live. It's a great pleasure to have you here. We are, as you know, in this, this series of hard, hard talks, looking at all the aspects of European aviation and asking ourselves the question, how do we build back better as we come through the crisis? As is usual at this stage in a hard talk, I'll ask the Director General of Eurocontrol, Mr Raymond Brennan, if he'd be so kind as to set out the scene for us and give us the most recent traffic statistics. Eamon, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the next hard talk. It's nice to see Andrew and a special thanks to Livia for joining us here today to give us another perspective on the whole COVID crisis and in particular aviation. As we normally do, it's nice just to look at where we are on the 10th of November 2020. We're looking at a very difficult situation in Europe. As you know, the Commission have, um, together with the ECDC, have designed this traffic light system, which is very good for everybody in Europe and something that we welcome here in Eurocontrol. But at the end of the day, it's all red at the moment and it looks more like a map for Donald Trump support than it actually does for anything else. So I'm hopefully to see patches of green as we approach Christmas. The market situation in Euro control is quite difficult at the moment. We continue to have very depressed levels of traffic. The seven day average yesterday was 58% of a reduction over 2019. And already this year, we have lost 5.3 million flights in the European system, which is hugely significant for everybody in Europe. But nowhere has the effect of this pandemic been felt more than also the impact it's had on aviation workers. And today's topic will very much look at this. If you just look at the airlines alone, in terms of job losses at Lufthansa, IAG, Norwegian, EasyJet, Ryanair and Wizz, you can see that a lot of people have been losing their jobs, they're on short time, they're facing uncertainty. But what I want to say to you today is there's more to this than airlines, because we also have to remember huge amounts of people are in the aviation value chain. In airports, uh, people working for Airbus and supplying Airbus with downstream parts like engines, like nacelles, like carpets. Then we have the maintenance organization, ground handlers, suppliers, and then people who do catering. And also the effect it's had on tourism, like taxi drivers, people with small coffee shops, this is really significant. But when you look at, for instance, just looking at the last seven days, you can see that Europe's largest airline, Ryanair, has had a 69% reduction on where it was this time last year. And actually look at the airlines have crept in like Pegasus. Interesting to see the EasyJet has fallen off the cliff completely and are not actually flying that much at the moment, and I understand their logic, uh, but we're looking at a difficult situation in the month ahead, and this is very much mirrored by the airports, where Amsterdam continues to be the largest airport, Istanbul is doing very well, buoyed up by a huge amount of domestic uh, traffic, and also generally we're looking at the effects of the lockdowns on Frankfurt and on Madrid Barakas. So, you remember last month we published revised traffic scenarios. We have had our traffic scenarios have been very accurate since we started publishing them in uh, April. And last week we had a 57% reduction and we had predict predicted a little bit more. But what I'm telling you today is that the prognosis for the next four to five weeks is actually we will break the red line and we will go down. So what's happening is basically, you know, a revision of, of um, the schedules by people like Ryanair, by EasyJet, by the network carriers. And remember, long haul travel has not resumed yet. So last week, we published our five year forecast. Now, can you imagine publishing in the middle of a pandemic a forecast? You need to be brain dead to do this. But we took this challenge on having talked with everybody. And when you look at how long it took to recover from the crisis, and this is important for the workers in the industry, 9-11, to get back to the same level of crisis took us 1.5 years. The global financial crisis, eight years to 2016, to recover the same level of activity as in 2008. So what we're predicting for COVID-19 is it will take four or five years to recover. So our five-year forecast,
So you can see from the you can see from the forecast on, ahead of you that basically the critical determinant is the vaccine. We have looked at the forecast, the economic metrics of the of the European Central Bank of the IMF. We've talked with all the aircraft manufacturers. We have actually looked at all the economic forecasts. But the thing that everybody agrees on is the vaccine. And thankfully, yesterday, the stock exchange also agreed on it because with the announcement of the possible vaccine yesterday, you saw huge changes to the positive in the shares of airlines, etc. So I hope you enjoy today's debate. Um, it should be interesting. Thank you very much for listening to us in your control. And I wish you all a safe meeting and also make sure that everybody works together to let the industry recover in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Good luck to both of you. Thanks very much, Eamon. And yes, indeed, as Eamon said, and of course I should have said, and I apologise, our guest today is Livia Spira. Uh, Olivia is the uh, the Director General of the European Transport Federation, the organisation which, of course, uh, covers not just road and maritime but aviation workers. So it's time that we look at, at, at Livia's thinking and, and what Livia's got to do because all of what we're going to do from here is about dialogue as we as we build back better. Livia Spera, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you and to discuss some of the issues to do with the labour aspects of aviation. Good afternoon, Andrew, and thanks for the opportunity of uh, having the ETF here expressing the view of uh, aviation workers today. Oh, I think it's important that we discuss all aspects of, of air transport and all, ex all aspects of any sort of recovery that we have. Perhaps I could ask you to set the scene for us. The ETF covers which workers in... Um, the ETF covers maritime, I think, road, rail, but also aviation. Which workers inside aviation do you cover? Well, our strength in aviation is exactly that we represent all professional, all workers in all groups, um, ground staff, air crew, ATM, maintenance, catering. And of course, this gives us strength, as I said. It gives us uh, the strength of solidarity among all the categories of workers, but it also gives us the, pos the possibility to give an overview, uh, to have an overview of the of the sector and not just of the different segments of the sector. So uh, are your member, do, does an air traffic controller or a pilot or a ground handler join the ETF or does he or she join an association which is part of the ETF? Now we are a, a union federation, so they, the members, the workers join uh, the, their trade unions on national level, and then uh, we have more than 230 trade unions from 41 European countries that are members of the ETF. Gosh, gosh, that must take a certain amount of managing to keep them all under control all at the same time. So, Livia, how do you see aviation a year from now, when we get over, when we finally recover from from the, uh, the the crisis? Well, our vision for the future of aviation, you see the banner at my back, is fair transport. And this is what we are working for, what we are we are fighting for. We uh, would like to build back, back, back better, and this includes a more socially responsible sector, a sector where social dialogue has a key role, a sector where terms and conditions are uh, bargained collectively with the unions um, and it is clear that today's decision will influence the sector of the future. Um, there are obviously, uh, in our view, uh, very deep cracks in, in transport and, and in aviation specifically, and um, we need now to fix those cracks. Um, if we look at what are the decisions that have been taken in, by, by some of the aviation actors at the moment, uh, we, uh, we would really like to stress that we need to think beyond this crisis. So if we think, for instance, about some uh, companies that are now um, postponing or uh, putting on hold uh, uh, training of licensed staff, this is a very bad decision for us because before March we were in a situation of shortage of certain profiles. Uh, we all of a sudden became in a situation of oversupply but we will be again in shortage in 2024 if we don't train those people now. So um, this will affect recovery, of course. Um, and uh, um, of course, the, the principle for us is that this crisis, there is a crisis that is a matter of fact, it's very, very deep, very dramatic, but 
uh, we shouldn't use it as an excuse to um, to affect uh, workers' terms and conditions as it was concretely done over the last uh, month. So that's what we've seen, though, isn't it? I mean, Eamon's figures are pretty stunning about... Uh, 80,000 uh, workers in the airlines themselves, 15,000 at Airbus, and as Eamon said, knock-on effects on, on um, manufacturers, on suppliers in catering and, and so on and so on. Do you, do you see that the solution, you, you just said we need to keep training, do you see the solution is that we just go back to the way it used to be? No, not at all. Not at all. As as I said, as I said earlier, we need to invert the trend. We need to tackle the 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 challenges and the cracks that are there and that are. So, very what are the cracks? What are the cracks? Well, from our point of view, one of the cracks is the social sustainability of the of the sector. Um, at the moment, uh, we see that there is. Uh, um, that this social sustainability is not there. We see employment models in some segment, segments of the sector that are not sustainable. We see some of the airlines are floating uh, their, uh, um, their social obligation, for instance, on the welfare state by employing just agency workers or by uh, using both self-employment, just, uh, just as an example. But, but... I'm, I'm more than happy to dig quite deeply into that because I think it's really interesting. On the 1st of January this year, IATA's figures are that there were 30 profitable airlines in the world. So getting back to that model isn't going to work, is it? We're, we're going to have to find a way to go forward that's different to the way we went in the past, surely. Yeah, absolutely. And for us, and this is part of our concept on fair transport, one of the key issues is fair price. Fair uh, price, we, right. Thank yeah, you. we need to move. Okay, we know uh, it's uh, aviation is a very competitive industry, especially when we talk about airlines. Uh, but um, we are also aware that there was a democratization of aviation. We are very happy that more people are able to fly than in the past. But... Um, it has to be sustainable in terms of pricing. Pricing is the key there to make the industry sustainable economically, environmentally, and socially. Especially it, does from have, our it, point does of have, it does have to be sustainable, doesn't it? Do you do you think in the future the, um, that there'll be as many airlines as there are now? Well, no. Or as there were before the crisis? Well, that's difficult to say. Um, what what we what we would like to have apart from considering about the number of airlines we would like to have more uh, uh, more responsible airlines towards their people toward the people they hire it's Res not just it's not just about the number for us in fact um we 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 even when we when we in our in our in our in our narrative we even go beyond the the duality between low cost carriers and uh, legacy airlines for for us this is not an issue we have uh, good, uh, I mean, we have good employers on both sides. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, low-cost carriers that are engaging with us and we have legacy airlines that are not engaging with us or yes. that are not behaving. So uh, I like the way you said that. We've got uh, good good carriers in the low-cost and in the legacy sector, sort of implying you had bad carriers as well. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to name names. I don't want to go down that line. But in, just coming back for a second to the to the crisis now, the, the situation now, do you support the, the the strategy that we've seen around Europe of governments giving state aid to airlines? Well, we think state aid is necessary. What we think as well is that there should be social string attached. And this is something that we we uh, unfortunately didn't see as much as we would have liked. Uh, because like not, what? what? What would you like to see attached to the state aid? We would like to see social strings attached. So we would but like to social see, strings meaning meaning job retention, working condition, engagement, collective bargaining. Uh, there have been too many cases of airlines that got state aid and then they have not kept employment level, that they have not engaged in in collective bargaining, that they are not engaged in negotiating plans with the union. But but isn't there uh, isn't there a conflict there? I mean. We agree that we, we're going to have a different aviation industry post-pandemic, I don't, whenever that is. Um, and we agree that they're going to have to be a change. So, so isn't job retention a, a conflict with that? I mean, surely part of the change is there will be different jobs or the jobs will be shaped differently. Well, 
this, these are all things that can be negotiated with the unions, you know. Unions are there and their job is to negotiate plans and to negotiate transition and to negotiate change when it's necessary. But uh, we know that there will be no avi aviation industry without their people. So for us, we are defending the people. Our mandate is to defend jobs. Now, fair and enough. And that, of, course, for. of course, and, that's your mandate. For us, and for us, um, there will there will no uh, be recovery without people. Well, we can wonder what is the value of saving airlines if we are not saving jobs. Um, well, I mean, but, no, sorry, what is the value of airlines if you're not saving jobs isn't actually quite the same, is it? What is the value of airlines is a different question to whether or not they should be an employment scheme. But let me go back. I, I heard you say something recently which I thought was really good and really correct, and I completely agree with you. You said your members are not afraid of 21st century technology, but you're not interested in 19th century conditions. I think that's 100% I agree with that. Um, but what about 20th century work practices? Isn't that the point? Isn't that the bit that we've got to address now? When we come back, it's got to be different, doesn't it? And if it's different, that's going to have an impact. Well, of course, but it was already different. Uh, uh, working conditions in aviation have deteriorated over the last 20 years. So uh, building back better for us means um, going forward and rethinking all the employment practice that right. have been uh, applied over the last years in order to uh, cut costs. And this is linked to the discussion about competition. Should we shouldn't we set a level playing field that doesn't allow this race to the bottom because bad working conditions come from, from this race to the bottom. Um, the fact that we that the, that the aviation world is changing, that the world is changing, doesn't mean that um, we need to uh, we need to intervene even more on lowering working conditions. This crisis has showed it very clearly that every wherever there is precarious work and wherever there is unsustainable work, this is offloaded on the state. Uh, and so employers are not taking the responsibility, not just in aviation, in all sectors. So um, precarious work and precarious uh, uh, um, employment models, as well as unsustainable uh, business models, are not good for the society at large. If we want to have aviation to take off again in 20. 24, hopefully sooner, we, we will need those people to be there. We, we need skilled people to be there. Um, uh, uh, no, no question of that. The point is, though, when aviation takes off in 2024 or sooner, if we're very lucky, um, we, we can't expect it to take off like it's, nine, like it's a, uh, 2019 anymore, can we? No, and I don't think we want to. Uh, okay. we, we, as, I, as I said earlier, we are uh, happy that uh, uh, flying is more democratic than it used to be 30 years ago, but it also has to be sustainable. We can't cut costs on flights, on, on flight tickets, um, while uh, um, who, who's paying for this price? Someone has to pay for this price. Huh? So at the end of the day, a flight can cost less than a bus ticket to go to the airport. and. Uh, um, yeah, uh, someone has to pay this price at the end of the day. And in most of the cases, it's workers. So um, it's fine to have a more democratic aviation sector, but it should be sustainable. So how do we get to that more more democratic aviation sector? You're, I think you're very keen on social dialogue. That's, that's a phrase I've heard a lot. How do you see the social dialogue working? Well, social dialogue uh, for us should be a key element in governing the, the industry along with, uh, with uh, intra-industry dialogue. Social dialogue is very important because through social dialogue you prevent conflicts. Through, so, through social dialogue you can address a lot of challenges, you can address change. Uh, through social dialogue you can, for instance, make sure that technological process is applied in a smooth way, in a, in a, in a shared way together with the workers. And social dialogue is also uh, uh, an added value that social partners have. They are privileged stakeholders in all this, especially at EU level, um, to shape policies. Okay, uh, so, so it, it, let, I'm, I'm, I, let's do a role play. If, you, if, we're social di if we're in a social dialogue, I assume part of what you have to do is consider the position from the person on the other side of the table's perspective, just as you'd expect me to consider your position. So if you were the CEO of an airline, what would you do now? What would you be doing at the moment? Well, I'm clearly not the CEO of an airline. I'm sitting on the but other you side. You are in a dialogue but, uh, with the CEO. And I'm, 
I'm sitting on, an, on another side, and uh, this is because I also have some value. So if I would be a CEO of, uh, of an airline, I would apply the same value that I have as the general secretary of the ETF, which should be respected people that are making the airline, uh, let the airline move. Now, as I said in the beginning, nobody is denying, we are in the middle of, of, of the worst crisis we have ever experienced. Uh, nobody is denying this. Um, one thing is to say, we have a crisis, guy, let's sit on the table and let's negotiate a, 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 a sound plan to go through this and to have uh, uh, less damage as possible on, on our people. Uh, uh, it was said by Mr. Brennan in the beginning that this is having repercussion, not just on aviation work, but all, all the rest of the, of the industries around aviation. But another thing is to say, there is a crisis, I fire all my people, even they are four loads, so they are paid by their unemployment benefit is paid by the government. And then this, the same people have to reapply for the job in the same company at the lower term and condition. So sure, this but, is what but, I, I would certainly wouldn't do. But let, let me just, sorry, let me just stick on the social dialogue path for a moment. Where we all agree, and, and I'm really, I'm, you know, very interested, pleased to hear you say you, you agree we need reform, we need to change things, we need to talk about the future of employment as well as employ as well as the airlines and, and all those sorts of things. Do you in the past we've seen some really quite strong industrial action by the on the part of workers. Um, and then even in the framework of the social dialogue, we've seen situations where, for example, the the controllers uh, refused, suspended their involvement uh, in in that sort of process. Do you think that dialogue is helped by those sorts of industrial reactions? Well, the other, I, I would put the question the other way around. Dialogue can prevent uh, conflict. So, uh, if you're as you're talking about ATM, in ATM, for instance, the ETF developed a guide uh, on how social dialogue can prevent conflict. So, the question is not on you know, very often trade unions, like strike is just the last resort. We don't take lightly a decision to go on strike. It's also very expensive for a trade union. It's a very difficult decision to take. So uh, before going on strike, and in many countries there are very strict regulation, before going on strike, you have tried everything. So yeah? strike, but strike is also a right. Strike, strike is a right that isn't tried in the, in the European Treaty, and uh, we 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 do not want to enter into discussion on the right to strike. Oh, please, so please, please don't. But, I'm a member but, of the Australian Labor Party. Please don't, please don't um, underestimate my belief in the right right to strike. But I'm more interested in some of the sort of guerrilla tactics that you, that that sometimes get used in the course of the dialogue. Um, the the controllers walked out on the on the discussion about what reform for um, reference pa re reference package number three, sorry, reference period number three might be. For example, they sorry suspended their involvement. Do you do you see that we're going to see more of those sorts of small nasty little pieces, or do you think we will actually have some sensible ideas here together collectively and and come to better conclusions? Well. I think in the specific cases of the of the controllers who walked out is because they felt that they were not taken seriously. So um, I think I think this is exactly when you know dialogue has to be meaningful. Social dialogue has to be meaningful. Okay. If yeah, we I feel think... that is not there's no good faith social dialogue, we have the right to stand up and to walk out the door. I, I think. Um, that, that dialogue has to be meaningful, I think, is exactly correct. But it does bring me back to my question about you being meaningfully dialoguing as the CEO of an airline. You, you, as an airline, you're going to be facing all sorts of challenges going forward, and some of those will involve restructuring, of course. What's your idea of sensible restructuring? Well, first of all, that is negotiated with the union. That is the basic principle. You know, unions are... They have, they have one, one main task is to sit down and negotiate. So uh, there will always be, there are of course different cultures in unions, but there will always be a willingness to negotiate. We all have tactics, employers also have tactics. We have industrial action, employers have other kind of tactics. We all have tactics, it's, it's a game, you know, negotiating mm -hmm. is a game and it's based on the power that you, that you manage to have. Um, of course, um, I, I can't say what is a good or bad plan. Uh, these are my members that are negotiating, uh, and, and they also sometimes have different views on this. Of course, we're a very diverse organization, but uh, I can say that early involvement and, and meaningful dialogue, meaningful involvement uh, works well. 
um, it's, it's, it, it's, as you said, it's a major crisis. There are always ways to find solutions. There are always, there are always been restructuring uh, in, uh, in many industrial sectors. And uh, when there was uh, preparation and involvement, uh, there was always uh, a solution that was found for the workers as well. Of course, it's never ideal. The restructuring is never ideal. But what I want to say is that you don't build dialogue all of a sudden in a crisis situation. Dialogue and trust has to be there. And this is what is sometimes lacking maybe in some segments of the aviation industry. You don't okay. sit for the first time in a major crisis negotiating a good redundancy plan if you don't have a history of dialogue behind you. I, I think that's fair enough. What, which employer groups do you think are the best to, dial, to, to negotiate with and which are the worst to negotiate with? No names. This, this could be fun. Well, nobody's <laughs> watching. Nobody's watching. Uh, well, I think in aviation, it's all about, well, you know, they're all very tough guys. It's a very tough sector. So I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't classify them in, in, in good and bad. Um, of, obviously, airlines is quite tough because uh, it's a very fragmented sector that is competing on very low profit margin. So um, it, it, it's extremely difficult to, to, uh, to negotiate with them. On the other hand, um, ground handling companies are really under pressure. So uh, they're also in a very, we're, we're also in a very difficult situation there as trade unions. Um, there are, as I said, in all sectors, there are employers that are more willing to negotiate than others. Uh, there are mixed experience. It depends on the people as well. It depends on the issues that are at stake. So I wouldn't uh, be able to give you a, a, a very clear picture on uh, who's bad, who's, who's, who's good, who's bad. Well, I thought it was worth asking anyway. I thought there might be some interesting gossip come out of it. Um, we've seen, uh, I, I don't want to name too many names, but I think it is obvious that we should talk about Ryanair, the largest airline in Europe, which perhaps once upon a time was your bete noire, but now has started to recognise unions, has started to recognise unions across trades and also across countries. Are you finding the relationship, do you think that's a relationship that we could model to use going forward? Well, um, I think the fact that we got into dialogue with Ryanair is a big victory for the ETF and for our movement. It's, uh, it, we obtained this, uh, it was not a walk in the park. It is not a walk in the park. Um, it was the fight of our members, the hard fight of our members that led us there. So I think that the certain moment Ryanair understood that they couldn't do without talking to us. We are not yet there. We are not yet where we would like to be, especially in certain countries. Um, we, we still see that we could, we could do better, but certainly this is something that we are very proud of. Um, do you see it as a model for the future? A model for the future? Uh, well, there are better collective bargaining agreements than what we have in Ryanair, to be honest. Uh, so um, we always uh, aim at, uh, at, at, at something more. Uh, but it is for us certainly a demonstration that um, there will not be airlines without unions and the unions are not there to bust airlines because um, as far as I know, Ryanair didn't uh, go bust uh, since it accepted unions. It, it, it accepted to dialogue with unions. And our objective is, is exactly not to bust unions, but to defend the interests of our members. But we are still, we are still, uh, there's still a long way to go. In Ryanair and in other low cost airlines, that where the situation is even worse than Ryanair, actually. Yeah, right. Well, I've, I've, again, I'm I'm not trying to pick on or, or highlight Ryanair, other than to note that it very famously went from being quite difficult to being quite um, pro, um, proactive and and supportive of of dialogue. So, I just I just wonder if you see that as the future. But how do you see airlines ten years from now? Well, if I have to talk as General Secretary of the ETF, I would like to see airlines that uh, take social responsibility, that uh, hire their staff directly and they do not hire through agencies, that do not use bogus of employment and they, they, they take uh, their responsibility as employers um, and that take not work as a commodity, but that take workforce as one of the biggest resources. So a bit more attention is paid to their to their um, to their uh, staff, but also we have said this many times today. Uh, airlines are not the only part are not the only part of aviation. 
so uh, the responsibility of our, of our lines should also be a societal responsibility towards the, other, the rest of the industry, what our lines do have, has, has a, have a, um, uh, a big implication for the rest of the industry as well. And uh, this we should take into account. So how do I see them? It, it very much depends on how we can uh, start the dialogue now, uh, all the parties together, uh, 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 the industry uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the institutional part uh, as well, uh, how, we can, uh, how, ke how we can work together on policies that allow uh, uh, a more resilient sector uh, a more sustainable sector, uh, economically, socially, and environmentally. Let's let's work. Thank you. <clears throat> let's let me ask you a question about resilience and a resilient sector. And I agree, it's not just airlines. Of course, it's it's across the board. And part of that resilience, I think, is going to in the future involve new technologies, isn't it? Um, do you agree with that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So so what? How do you see the interface between the new technologies and the way we did things in the past? Well, we we can't deny. I mean, technological progress has always been there. Of course, now in the last few years, it, there's a, there's there has been an acceleration. But um, in transport, but especially in aviation, technological progress is not is nothing new. Um, now, um, we as unions, again, we are always available to negotiate, and the the the, the facts have proved that when there have been uh, technological improvements which have been negotiated from a very early stage with the unions, the process has, has been smooth. Uh, if technological progress is used to enhance safety, we will always be supporting it. If technological process is used to um, attack the human element and attack working conditions, then of course we have a problem and we will fight against it. But it's very much about the er very early involvement. Um, right. so, Okay, let me ask a slightly different question, a slightly personal question given an experience I've recently had. Do you think people should be asked to work for no money? For no money? Yeah, because well, I was I was recently asked to do something by the controllers and pilots, which would have involved me doing it for free. I, I'm sure you join me in saying that's outrageous, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. No. Thank you. Good. <laughs> um, working for no money is not working, it's volunteering. So well, that's something else. Well, indeed, or slavery in this case. Um, so, how do you see how do you see us developing from here? Do you do you? Uh, sorry, let me start that again. The, the gig economy is, I think, a real issue. I mean, it's an issue at one level from a worker's perspective, but it's also something that a lot of workers embrace. Um, you you hear of people all the time who are quite happy to be in the gig economy, and 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 do you see that as how do you how do you interface or how do you manage that interface between the classical way of doing things and the gig economy? Well, the, the problem with the gig economy for us as trade unions is not the gig economy itself; is the fact that we we have in front of us employers that are not uh, that do not want to act as employers, so they want to act as platforms. We have problems in with traditional employment uh, employers uh, and the, we, in the gig economy with the gig economy platforms alike but it's just that when you have employers in front of us we know to whom to talk uh, and, and we can negotiate when we have the gig economy uh, platforms that are denying to be an employer that we have a problem uh, of course there is there are some you know, okay, we're, it's also a very broad concept, the economy. What are we talking about? If we're talking about people who are attracted because it's a very cheap service and very quick service, then again, the price, is, the price of this is mostly paid by workers. Um, if you think about workers who are attracted to work in the gig economy, there are several categories, but most of them are people that have no other choice. Uh, so again, um, uh, we, we, this is another, this is another, uh, well, broad subject that should be regulated because uh, regulation are lacking behind and those who are paid, paying the price for this are the workers. Well, it's, yeah, well, it is a broad subject and we could talk for some time, but let me bring another broad subject to the table in the few minutes we've got left, which is sustainability, by which I mean environmental sustainability. Um, again, part of your dialogue, you said, was to ensure that anything, any arrangements going forward has got to be both economically and environmentally sustainable. I presume that the workers of European aviation believe in environmental sustainability? 
Yeah, sure. It's it's uh, it's not an easy subject, of course, as it's not easy for for anybody. Uh, we believe that technology will lead us to a more environmental environmentally sustainable aviation. Uh, we think that technology is 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 can have the biggest impact on this. So fuel fleet, uh, we know. We all know that we are still far from the objective. So we all know that what is needed is research uh, and development, it's investments. We, we would be uh, very much in favor of seeing more investment in this also from countries. This is a global problem, uh, which cannot probably be uh, dealt with uh, only by the industry. Um, what we believe as well is that it's not by liberalizing certain segments of the uh, aviation sector that we are going to get more environmental sustainability. We really believe that technology will lead the way to it. Right. Um, all this, all this investment, of course. Where's the money going to come from? Well, the the, the money should come from taxation, and uh, uh, of course, the more uh, jobs we have. Uh, the more states will be able to reinvest money in uh, uh, in uh, development, for instance. That's that's very simple. And so that's why we need to keep people on uh, on uh, on good contracts because the better the contract, the higher the contribution they give to uh, to public money. Absolutely, and 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 again, fair enough. Um, just back to the social dialogue for a moment. Do you? Do you think there's enough dialogue at the moment, or do you think, or would you like to see more? Well, there, there's never we we can, as unions we can never be happy enough about social dialogue, but level social dialogue. Um, if you if you talk about uh, the European social dialogue, which is something we are directly involved in, um, it can be it can get extremely difficult because it's very fragmented. Uh, so we have a plurality of of employers in front of us, and they are uh, also. Um, uh, Quite divided sometimes, uh, so we we could we could do better. We could have a more meaningful dialogue, probably more uh, uh, more structural dialogue. On the other hand, we have also achieved good things over the last uh, years. What we are also we what we are also aware is that we we need an industry dialogue, not just a social dialogue. So they, that go that both dialogues go hand in hand. Well, indeed. What's the difference between social dialogue and industry dialogue? Well, social dialogue is uh, employers and employees representatives sitting together and discussing about social economic, mainly social economic issues. Uh, these are uh, partners, social partners that have a mandate clearly from their members. Industry dialogue is wider than this, and it includes anybody else who's involved in the sector. For instance, at the moment, we are having aviation roundtable promoted by DG Move, and this is much larger than just uh, employers and employees. We also have some employers, uh, let's say, the industry association that do not do not have a mandate to act at, as employers. So in this case, they just represent their company without being an employer in front of us. Right. So so you see social dialogue as a more one-on-one uh, -on -one or, you know, sp issue-specific sort of thing, whereas industry dialogue is a broader subject? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we've got lots of uh, you've you've been very um, vocal in your support for making sure airlines continue to get bailout money and so forth. I'm just I'm interested in in where that goes. If we keep on bailing out all these airlines and and let us pray that the vaccine arrives, don't we end up with a whole bunch of zombies? Why do we have zombie airlines? Why would we need those? Well, we we don't. We we don't need necessarily to have zombie airlines. Uh, we need to have we need to design uh, uh, ways to make them sustainable, to create uh, also to intervene in the market if necessary, um, and to 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 act. Uh, let's say in in uh, to reverse the way we have acted so far, uh, and to intervene also in competition issues and in the market so that airlines don't don't become zombies. So you'd like to see more directed, more intelligent support from here, perhaps, as we get to the end of this crisis? Well, indeed, it would it would be it would be uh, it would be uh, um, it would be very interesting and very important to give 
uh, a support that is clearly linked to a strategy and to objective and to a strategy to make airlines sustainable, also socially, of course. That, that, would be a, that would be a great outcome. Let me ask one last question, if I may. Um, we're, we're in a, the Eurocontrol hard talk series. What more do you think Eurocontrol, what Eurocontrol can do to better support European aviation and to help us build back better, do you think? Eurocontrol is doing a very good job and uh, has taken some good initiative like the deferral of, of, uh, of, uh, of charges, for instance. Now, Eurocontrol, as the ETF, is a members organi member based organization. So um, we, as ETF, we have to respond to our members. Eurocontrol has to respond to, to its members. Uh, so uh, our view is that Eurocontrol should look after uh, European-wide issues responding to, to the member states uh, that are paying the fees and maybe not getting involved in, uh, uh, in local issues. But on the other hand, and I think today's uh, hard talk is the demonstration of this, whatever can be done also by Eurocontrol to foster dialogue and to promote dialogue is very much welcome because we saw it today, it's dialogue is a key word for uh, building uh, uh, a better aviation industry, and this is what is needed at the moment. So this is very much appreciated. Thank you very much, Livia. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you agree that we have had some dialogue today, and I hope it was a helpful dialogue. Uh, and thank you again to Livia for her time. I, um, I very much appreciate that. Just a quick reminder that our next hard talk is on the 30th of November. Uh, we're again um, in dialogue, this time with the pers perspective of the airports, a conversation with Yus Lama, who is both the uh, D uh, the um, managing Director of Munich Airport, but importantly, the Chairman of ACI Europe. And then on the 7th of December, Mr Michael O'Leary, who you may have heard of, uh, the Chief Executive of Ryanair. So there, the two hard talks left uh, for the rest of this year. We will have more hard talks next year. Thank you again for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this. I look forward to seeing you next time.